Hi there, and welcome to the Paula Fiscal Show. My show airs on Sundays at 3 o'clock p.m. on Channel 29, and I also upload it to YouTube and Instagram, Twitter, and there is a Facebook page. So welcome to the show. This is the anniversary of the one-year time that I have the show. When I began the topics that we were going to cover, I included the word finance. Now, over the year, I have had entertainment, education, criminal justice, and I didn't have any finance people. So this year, I'm going to start off this show with a what I would call a fun manager. Now, my uh, studio producer just said, fun? Yes, that sounds like something I can enjoy. What we are saying is funds. So we're going to talk a bit about financing businesses and also some of the uh, funds that are available for those of you in business. We want to welcome Robin Lee Allen, and he is located here in the city of San Francisco, and he hails from the East Coast. He is currently the managing partner of a company called Esperance. So welcome very much to the show, Robin. Thank Please you, let us know a little bit about your, your background and how you started in the industry, and we welcome you. Thank you. Um, so yes, basically, um, I went to Babson College in Massachusetts. Um, I then followed up with some studies in New York at the New School University and also at the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University and applied economics. Um, I did my undergrad degree in entrepreneurship and legal studies. Um, I started off um, doing investment banking and something called turnaround consulting, which is basically crisis management for for-profit firms. Um, typically, I only deal with small businesses, so that means $50 million in revenue and under. Wait a second. Let's go back to that. $50, 50, million, $50 million in and revenue below. and under. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that you'll be spending time here in San Francisco with companies that are in the $250,000 range, or is there a, a limit? Is there a minimum? It depends. Um, typically now we've been doing a lot more looking at principal investments, which means actually trying to acquire firms. And um, typically when you're running a fund, there you don't really have so much time to look at $150,000 deals. It's better to look at, you know, say one or two $50 million deals. So you're, you're talking about acquisitions? Acquisitions, that's correct. Mergers? Um, in some, yeah, that's an exit, yes. But uh, startups, are those very much included? If you work um, with a startup, how much? For my fund, we don't do um, startups. We provide, we provide a lot of advice to startups um, in the past. Uh -huh. um, but as far as actually, you know, capital infusions, um, it's just not, not our area. Um, so we're the, talking about capital infusions. In which case that means something like the the uh, show on television, the Shark Tank. Um. Yeah. Actually. Yes. I know. I know Damon. Um. Yeah. So it's something like that. Yes. You know one of the star Shark Tank uh, Shark Tank people. Yeah, Damon John. Yeah. Yeah. We invited him to come over to Babson College, and he taught over there for a year. Oh, wonderful! Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's that's good news because when those of us that are involved in vi business, and I say this because. I myself have been a business development consultant in San Francisco for over 30 years. We love to watch shows that infuse money into a good idea and a, a good uh, uh, profit-making uh, enterprise, but we can't always tell exactly where to put this money. Maybe you can share with the audience a little bit about how you determine which companies you're able to help. Yeah, that's, um, that's actually quite important. Um, typically, a lot of people will say, oh, well, I have a good idea. And from my standpoint, an idea isn't really worth a lot. Um, I'm looking at the team and the team's ability to execute. 
And so typically what you'll find is that execution is going to be pretty much everything. In order to do that, you need to have people. You don't necessarily need a lot of formal education. What you need is the ability to start a task, complete it, do it in an efficient manner, and in a way that will ensure that not too much cost is involved, that will eat into the profit margin. Um, especially in the startup phase, that's really, really important because you have a limited amount of capital um, and you're trying to get to profit as quickly as possible. I um, mean, you want to avoid having like really high burn rates. A lot of venture capitalists, this is why we don't do venture capital is the burn rate's too high. So you're talking about then going into a business and uh, getting their accounts receivables, their, their accounts uh, payables, taking a look at their payroll, uh, taking a look at their overhead, and uh, then determining from all of those pieces of information, all of those pieces of intelligence, exactly where you can help them? Exactly, yes. Um, typically, private equity is about cash flow. Um, it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Um, and so we're looking at various ways to increase cash flow and to manage it in such a way that the enterprise will be sustainable. If you don't have enough cash, you die. It's really simple. So the difference between cash flow and profit and loss is? Um, yeah, um, with the profit and loss statement, um, what you see is a lot of um, finagling around. Um, so a company can have a loss, but they can the still have The word finagling it. is reference to? Um, oh, um, there's something called GAP, General Accepted, Generally Accepted Accounting Practices. Okay. Um, and people, that allows a lot of leeway for a lot of stuff that's legal but not necessarily moral. And, um, and so my job is to dig through that and actually get to the cash flow reality. Okay, so when you're digging through that, then that means that you spend a couple of days, a couple of weeks. How long does it take for you to go through a company and... and um, due, get the real figures. Yeah, depending on the size of the company, due diligence can take anywhere between two weeks and maybe as long as six months if it's a really big company. Um, but yeah, the point is, is to get to really, really dig down into the numbers and get an understanding of them. Um, and then do you also do interviews with the all the employees? Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, do you get uh, into their personal lives to see whether or not they're, one of them is spending a million dollars every year? Um, I do conduct interviews with all the employees. Um, I, don't, I try not to dig too much into people's personal lives. Um, I've always been big about respecting people's privacy, so that's really important. But uh, on the other hand, if there should be a large amount of cash flow and there isn't, you're going to have to do some intelligence work. Exactly. Yeah, I've had um, situations in which employees that were hard up on cash actually were taking cash from the register, so it's definitely a concern. So then, when you do the service for a business or a company and you believe that they're a good candidate for a cash infusion, then where do you go to get the funds? Um, typically, before we um, were doing kind of one-offs for each business. So basically there are a circle of investors that I go to and I pitch them the idea and they say, okay, I want in or this person wants in and another person doesn't. And it's fairly simple. It's a pretty straightforward process once you know the people and you have the connections. And is it similar to when you're applying for a mortgage and your mortgage broker takes your deal to all the various banks? Oh. Yes, in that sense, yes. Um, yeah, basically, I'm a deal syndication specialist in that regard. So, yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah, it's very and so when you're looking for a uh, fund to present to the owner, do you bring in one fund, two funds, three funds? Is there a, a minimum or a maximum? No, it just depends upon who wants to invest. Um, Right now we're doing, we've been focusing more on our own funds, so it makes it easy for us to just acquire all the stock ourselves. Um, but when we're dealing with multiple entities, um, you know, we wouldn't want more than like say three or four. Um, you can't have too many voices at the boardroom table. And you're talking about your own funds, so that means that your company invests and is looking to invest in companies here in San Francisco. Yes, yes, we are a principal investor. Mm -hmm. And what kind of companies 
to give uh, our viewers a, a chance to take a look. Are you looking for right now? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so basically, um, and <coughs> sort of differentiating us from a lot of other people in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, we actually invest in real companies. So those bakeries, those mom and pop shops, um, those automotive repair specialists, um, we've done restaurant groups, transportation companies, bottling plants, um, people who produce real goods, I'm sorry, goods and services and who service the, what I call the real economy. Um, so we're not so heavy on the tech focus. We actually deal with real businesses that actually supply people's day-to-day -day needs. I was just going to ask you that. What about the tech companies? But you're saying that your fund does not fund the tech companies, but it would fund a bakery or a, what about? about uh, the industry of pets. You realize there's more pets in San Francisco than there are people. No, no, that's, let me reword that. There are more pets in San Francisco than there are children in our school system. Yeah, I think that's Over definitely a trend. Over 50,000 pets in San Francisco. Yeah, that, I've definitely noticed that where there are, um, everybody has a dog and I met a woman today, I didn't know she had like three or four cats and yeah, so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're willing to look at all of it. Um, again, it's just a function of cash flow. And a lot of technology firms out of the door, they don't necessarily have the cash flow that's necessary to do what it is. I so if I wanted to uh, recommend a friend of mine who has a dog walking business, and she has about 10 dog walkers, and uh, they also do grooming, and uh, they come in and, and they do the uh, mobile grooming, and uh, they're talking about looking for funds. Would that be the kind of a company that you would talk with, or is that uh, too well, real? If I, I mean, I, w I would do like a quick analysis of the pricing. So like, let's say that it's um, $20 an hour. Um, you have 10 walkers that are doing five dogs um, at the same time per hour. Um, so that would be um, $100 a person, and the 10 walkers, that's $1,000 uh, um, an hour. Um, and say they only did five hours a day, um, it's 5,000 and Wonderful. just say five well, days. We do have, um, so we're at 25. I'm not certain um, how many yeah, restaurants we, we have. That it's around the, the numbers of, of the month. pets. So yeah, we I'm have sure. so many restaurants here that open and close, and, and then there are some restaurants that, that stay around for years and have been here for years, like mm -hmm. Mel's on uh, Gary and on Van Ness. Uh, Mel's uh, is, is the, used to be the drive-in with um, the uh, San Francisco Tennis Club former owner Mel Weiss, Weiss and his two sons. That restaurant, when you walk in the door, everything looks very standardized. All the restaurants look like cookie-cutter restaurants, but they are owned and operated by a local person. So. Is that the type of restaurants that you would assist in funding, or are you looking for more of a Denny's or a McDonald's franchise, or how is that? How is that yeah. determination made? Typically, we don't do the Denny's and McDonald's. We don't have that much money. So, like that local place that's been around for ten, you know, maybe five or more years, that's right. That's the sweet spot. Um, so that's really yeah. And if it's popular and everyone knows it and they frequent it, that's all the better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a, a lot of restaurants that are, are like that. Uh, and in this city, the act of eating out is so common. Some people never eat at home. They always eat out. And there are so many restaurants that uh, you could go to, you could make a list of all the restaurants we have in town and start at the beginning of the year, and you'd never finish and never end because there are so many that by the time you reach the end of the year, that same restaurant you started at first might be changed, so you have, have another restaurant to go to. Yeah, it's really weird. Most restaurants um, that start up will fail um, within the first year of doing business, so it's really funny What's that... What's the, the percentage? The percentage of oh the failures in restaurants? Goodness. Um, within the first year, um, I want to say it's at least 50%. 50%. Within the first 12 months. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's extremely high. Well, it is, yeah. it, is, uh, it, it is a high-risk business because it yeah, the deals with so perishables. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you think you're going to have 100 people and you only have 50 people, that 50% of the food that you bought for that day goes bad. 
Yeah. So yeah. what do you do with that? You turn it into meatloaf? You can all serve so many meatloafs, right? <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people forget that small businesses need to be focused on actually finding a way to add so much value that they can justify charging a higher price than the big box chains that you see everywhere, like the McDonald's and Denny's that we mentioned earlier. By providing better service, a higher quality product, you can actually justify a higher price point and get a bigger profit margin. When you're small, you need the you need a, you need that big margin. There's no way around that. For example, if you happen to have a fabulous recipe for jambalaya that you got from your aunt or or your yeah. your uh, grandmother. Yeah, if you're making jambalaya, call me. Then <laughs> <laughs> you won't you, you won't need a cash infusion. <laughs> then you want to enhance. Or, or promote the fact that you have the best jambalaya in town mm -hmm. and, and you want to be able to serve that, say, every day. Would that be a restaurant you'd be interested in funding? Um, yeah, typically we don't do the startups. We do people that are kind of established and that have run into some sort of trouble. Um, so we specialize in turnarounds. Um, again, because the failure rate for new restaurants is so high, so high. It, um, we'd end up losing far too much money. We manage money for um, pension funds and stuff, so we can't take that sort of risk on. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But if you've had a restaurant now, say, for two or three years and you're looking to expand it, then that would be exactly. yeah. a business that you would look at. Yes, yeah. Yeah, if you're trying to grow, yeah, and we like growth, yeah, because growth will allow, you know, us to return the money to the investors. So can you tell us how much of an interest rate you charge for the funds that are put in by your funding? Is there just a range? Can you give um, us a range? Yeah, typically we tend to do equity deals. Um, so what that means is that we'll actually acquire the stock in the actual company and then we'll either sell it back to the founders or sell it to another group or in some rare cases even do an IPO, which is a public offering on the public markets. Um, and that's typically the way that we focus on value creation um, any small businesses that loses, I'm sorry, any small business that loses focus on serving customers for any reason is going to be doomed. So we don't saddle people with debt and interest rates that they can't possibly afford um, because we require a return on investment that's so high that, you know, it's better to do it with the equity. So yeah. if you wanted to use an example, for example, um, I have a restaurant and I want to get a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars to assist with some new equipment that I think would would uh, make it easier for our, my customers to come in and, and uh, eat. Would, would I then go to you and say I need a hundred thousand dollars and I'm willing to sell 30 percent of my stock? Um, well yeah basically it would be just kind of give you an idea of the kind of numbers we're talking about. Um, it would be, you know, I own a small business, I've run it, we have maybe two locations and we're doing a certain amount of revenue. I don't want to really crunch too many numbers at the moment. But we'd come in and do give something like $5 million, um, to enable, you know, you were to really develop a sort of system in which you can get economies of scale. Um, so that, like say if you can, if you open up five restaurants and you buy a certain amount of fish, then you could get a lower per unit cost. That's right. That's right. You would reduce the cost per unit. Yeah. And uh, so then would somebody from your firm actually be on site in the restaurant or how, how does that transaction take place? Do I need to get an attorney? Do I need to get my CPA sitting at the table? How many people does that involve? Um, well, it can involve as few as many as people want it to involve. Um, typically, we tend to do, we tend to try to focus on not having too many people at the table because it just complicates things. Um, the more objections that are brought up and the more, um, it, I mean, it can get highly technical and that's sort of a waste of time. Um, we don't want to waste time. We typically want to get on with the investment and, you know, and help, you know. the. But you have to have stock. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you take equity. Yes. So yeah. if it is a sole proprietorship, it won't work. You have to have an incorporated oh, yeah. oper oh, operation. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have stock that you can purchase or that you can take in return for your funding. And then do you also take additional stock for the uh, interest rate or do you take money back? Um, no, the way that we would typically exit is through selling the stock interest, the equity interest that we have in the company. 
Yeah. So then you would exit from the operation by selling the stock. Yes. And so then someone else would come in and be holding the, the, the stock for this customer. Yeah, it depends upon the situation. A lot of times you can do what are called founder buybacks, in which the founder themselves will actually buy back the stock from us. Um, and there are many financing methods to do that. Um, you know, um, but you know that if, if there's not enough cash flow, it may settle the company with like a little bit of debt. Um, so it's you know it's important to be kind of mindful of it. There are lots of options, but it's all on a kind of case per case basis. Yeah. I see. I see. So that if someone was interested in getting some of these funds, you then are suggesting, or that there are some requirements, there are some basic fundamentals, such as you need to have been in business for two to three years, you need to have a um, good set of books mm -hmm. so that you can take yeah, a look. Basically, yeah. I, um just for kind of deals like this, you know, I, I think the best um, conduit to get in contact with someone like me is, um, like I do, right now I'm doing a lot of work at um, Wilson, Sincini, Goodrich and Rosati, WSGR, um, and they have a space for entrepreneurs that's on 139 Townsend Street, which is downtown San Francisco. Um, so coming into, into there and talking to one of the attorneys there, they're the number one law firm in the United States for venture capital and by extension, you know, private equity in general. And then their competitors, Fenwick and West, I believe, which also, obviously, if they're competitive, they have a good operation. Um, so, you know, f law firms tend to have the connections that people would want in that regard. So you would mm -hmm. start with your legal entity Yeah, first. yeah, legal counsel, yeah. Right. Yeah, you want, and it's not any legal counsel. We're talking competent legal counsel and legal counsel that's connected. Yeah. Well, I happen to know the numbers of San Francisco attorneys here. We have 15,000 <laughs> yeah, attorneys sure that are can. able to practice in this city. I don't know the exact numbers of how many actually are practicing, but we do have a lot of attorneys here. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> if there are 15,000, I would probably say maybe 10% of the ones that you want to be looking for and trying to deal with. So then we open up the yellow pages and we look for what? Um, I would look for WSGR. That would be the go-to. WSGI. You would R, WSGR. That's Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati. Just look up number one venture capital law firm and they'll pop up. Um, Wonderful. And say somebody would like to contact you to have a good lunch or a chat. Yeah, basically, um, if you put my name into Google, um, my LinkedIn profile will pop up. Um, it's my full name, Robin Lee Allen. It may be on the screen. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but it's um, that it, would be the way to reach you. That'd yeah. be the best way to yeah, reach. Yeah, basically, and then yeah, connect to me through LinkedIn, and that's probably the best way. Yeah. Robin Lee Allen. And so I want to ask you just a little bit about how did you get started in this industry, mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you wanted to advise some of our viewers how to do what you do. Oh, how to do the same thing. So basically, um, I'm going to give a really, really simplified version. Um, I basically started off working in an investment bank in New York. Um, around the same time I started doing little consulting jobs for small businesses, um, I realized you could make the same amount of money um, doing, you know, helping small companies as I was working at the bank. And so I started doing it full time. And over the years, my reputation just kind of spread around and people would ask me what I do. It's kind of like what's happening in San Francisco now. The more people I talk to, the more they say, oh, I know this person, I know that person. And um, it just kind of grows on its own. Um, but um, the, the first rule is to really just kind of go out and do an excellent job. Um, it doesn't require, again, it doesn't require a lot of education. It doesn't require a bunch of certifications um, to do turnarounds or to do alternative investment fund management. Um, but it does require that you be really, really skilled. You have to know what you're doing. You have to have read up and studied. Um, having a great education helps you a lot with investors. Um, but the big thing is, you know, really going out and starting to practice. Um, and typically that will involve taking deals that people are overlooking for some reason or another. Um, so there's some sort of moral hazard there. but. You know, that's the way that you get in. 
Well, we want to thank Robin Lee Allen for joining us on the Paul Murphy Scow Show. And uh, for those of you that are in business and are looking for uh, assistance in funding and uh, would like to learn a little bit more about these types of funds that are available, it would be a good idea, as uh, Robin recommended, to take a look at, what was that again? Yeah, the name of the firm is Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati. Um, and they have another, um, um, there's another firm called Fenwick and West, but WSGR, um, that's the name of the firm that I recommend the most. Fenwick and West, there you go. So once again, thank you for joining us. We are looking forward to hearing from you. My uh, handle is Paula Fiscal TV for Twitter. And I also have an email of paulafiscalshow at gmail.com. And I have a Facebook page. So like us on Facebook page. And I want to give a shout out to also for this show for Chef Sharon Lee because it's because of Chef Sharon Lee's invitation for me to go to City Hall to celebrate the Black History Month that I had the rare opportunity of meeting Robin Lee Allen. So once again, Thank you so much for joining us.